Hello, this is Mary Wingo, and I am broadcasting from beautiful Cuenca, Ecuador. I'm telling you, one day, if you guys have time, please come visit this amazing country and city, Cuenca, Ecuador. It's an awesome, awesome city. Okay, okay, so... Um, if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and um, take a look at my other two videos on trauma, number one and number two. Um, I'd gone over um, some basics. Uh, uh, what? <sighs> There's been a lot of research on trauma. It's been really fragmented, and uh, this is uh, you know, the best analysis um, that I believe that that is out there. That kind of pulls everything together. And, you know, in a way that, that Joe Average can understand. And that's the purpose, right? Um, you know, we want to uh, be able to explain uh, complex uh, scientific, uh, academic, or academic uh, concepts. Because the public's paying for it, right? Okay, or, in the or most of it. <laughs> so we want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, Joe Average can understand what's going on. Okay, so... Um, if there's any part of this conversation that goes a little bit over your head, go over my other um, trauma videos. They're incredible. So take a look at those. Okay. So as a recap, the definition of stress is a rate of adjustment that we undergo in order to adapt to whatever the environment is throwing at us. Okay. And remember, um, as an organism, as a living being, uh, we have two options. Uh, can we change the environment or do we have to change ourselves to fit the environment? Okay, the first option only comes with advanced animals and I, I would posit uh, when um, those advanced animals, we'll talk about humans, are mature, okay, or their brains are fully developed at like 25, okay, or maybe a little bit younger. But um, the ability to change the environment is very much uh, what makes us humans human, right? Because you don't see very, well, I mean, you see a little bit, but you don't see animals actively, profoundly changing their environment to lessen their stress. Uh, a lot of times, um, well, almost all the time, they're at the uh, mercy of the environment and they have to change their bodies and their mental outlook in order to adapt. Okay, so, okay, so that, that's pretty easy, right? And it goes in the line of everything that the, the master of the biology in general, Dar Charles Darwin, um, discovered in the Galapagos about 200 years ago, well, a little bit less, 180, 85 years ago. So um, anyway, more about stress. So we were talking about in the last video the, the problem of dissociation, okay? So um, let, let's talk about this for just a second, okay? When we are affected by um, disorders, problems of the, we'll just call it problems of extreme stress, Okay, when when we when we um, when our capacities have been overwhelmed, and this can include what we experienced as uh, children as well. Okay, um, there is a tendency, as we talked about before, um, to override the fight or flight uh, um, or flee. Fight or, no, fight or flight, fawn or freeze. Okay, the fight or flight system. Okay, so the fight or flight system uh, comes in as a natural defense uh, mechanism. Okay, and um, when those systems become overwhelmed. Okay, so, so they're great and when we're not overusing them or exploiting uh, those mechanisms. These are mechanisms, okay? So they're not it's nothing magic. It may seem like magic, but what it is, it's just a new understanding of biology. So when these mechanisms are overwhelmed, um, basically we have um, we we go into um, a state. Um, it's it's like a, what we call the polyvagal uh, theory. Okay, so we go we we bypass the fight or flight system. 
okay, which uh, is uh, mediated. I'm going to make this real simple, okay, okay, so we're not going to go really heavy into the mechanism because I want to confuse everybody, but our natural response is the adrenaline and um, the, uh, the cortisol systems kind of taking over and making us more pliable and flexible to change our bodies to fit the environment. Now, when we override those systems and we um, basically slip into the freeze stage, um, basically, um, this is when things get really bad, okay? So everything that we associate with the terror of living with um, disorders caused by trauma or extreme stress come from this area, okay? So let's demystify. So our natural fight or flight defenses um, are um, over overridden and... Um, you know, maybe. And again, this can be due to conditioning, okay? I mean, so we exposed to, you know, a lot of stressors, more than we can handle. We can't recover from each one. So we, uh, uh, you know, developed a very ugly, I don't even want to say habit. It's like a biological, I don't, because habit would denote that it's totally voluntary, but because it is a conditioned reflex, it is a habit that it's a lot of work to change. A lot of people can't change it. So you're slipping when you, uh, you know, when you're, you know, are under extreme stress, uh, you slip into the dissociative state, which is part, it's not part of the fight or flight response. It's part of the, what we call the parasympathetic parasympathetic rest and digest response. But we're not resting and digesting. Basically, we got the deer in the headlight um, look and we're freezing and, um, you know, we cannot run, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot fight, we cannot, you know, do any other um, uh, constructive defensive response. So we just freeze. Okay, and why is this? Um, well, nature put this together because uh, sometimes the best thing to do is just to play dead. See, it's kind of like the playing dead, the, you know, and just sometimes, just sometimes when we can play dead, uh, the uh, enemy will give up and leave us alone. Either that or tear our heads off because <laughs> we're not fighting back. Um, and so you can see, now this is very ancient, okay? This is a very ancient response, okay? So this is like, uh, this is why this habit um, is really part of our biology. And you can, uh, even though it can be reversed, it's a hell of a lot of work, um, as anybody who has trauma knows. Okay, so, um, so you are in this um, sort of kind of dreamlike state you know, you uh, usually you perceive, you're perceiving everything. Uh, well, usually you're perceiving everything quite clearly. It's just your response is totally frozen. You know, like you mean to cry out and, you know, or you mean to move, uh, to run, and, and you're just frozen. To, you can't really respond. And like I said before, this little ugly but necessary spot of our existence. Um, this is what I've said before. This is where all of our bad, bad coping habits. And I, I, I will say uh, every single symptom of mental illness comes from, okay? And so, um, you know, like I said before, any bad habit that you have um, any so like any habit that you have that is a result from stress so like say we'll just we'll just look at overeating you know we know we know all about eating for stress well understand so, so this is this is we all know that that's common okay but understand when you slip out of that state of self-control when you know that you shouldn't be overeating okay that point is when your frontal lobe, this part here, 
it's for whatever reason too fatigued to control behavior that benefits you in the long run. You're just looking for self-soothing. You're looking to check out. Okay. And um, so we talked about this. I want you to think about that. You know? Now, there are many repercussions. It's not just a mental state. So, so um, anytime uh, we slip into a compulsion, a psychotic reaction from anything, whether we're, we're afflicted with schizophrenia or a bipolar or a, a, you know, a very extreme forms of depression, it's all the same. We have a stressor. It overwhelms our systems to adapt, and all of a sudden, um, for whatever reason, our thoughts become dysregulated, our emotions become dis Because what is controlling this? Okay, that is this. This is the frontal lobe. This is what makes us human right here. Okay, and this, this frontal lobe, and I'll be a little bit more specific. You don't have to remember this, but we're talking the orbital, frontal, and ventromedial is what controls a lot of the emotional uh, and uh, social aspects um, of, uh, of, uh, of stress. And uh, so as we are exposed to stress, okay, so for instance, we're exposed to a stressor and it's up to a moderate level. So a moderate, we'll just say a moderate level of adrenaline and cortisol release, okay? Well, up to a moderate level, our frontal lobe is actually sharp. And see, this is what it was there for. This is why, you know, we want to, this is neat. Okay, getting back into Darwin and uh, evolution. This is why we have succeeded as a species. I mean, I don't, I don't know, have we succeeded? We've torn stuff up pretty good. But this is why we've dominated as a species. Um, we're able to use our frontal lobe in order to project it to the future for plans that benefit us for, okay, so that relieve stress and, uh, uh, you know, and that uh, promote, uh, you know, promote adaptation, promote success, okay? So that, that is our frontal, and, and what else does it do? It also um, controls um, automatic, um, you know, just, you know, just a blurting out response. So, um, for instance, you know, it helps us in the social realm. Um, you know, someone cuts, cuts you off in traffic. <laughs> well, when you blurt out that obscenity, that is, um, you know, the emotion that you feel, the powerful rush of rage, and then the obscenity. That is actually um, your frontal lobe dysregulated. You know, for whatever reason, you know, you just can't take it and rah, you know. So... We can imagine in ourselves when we feel ourselves not concentrating well, um, not being able to control our behavior. Okay, we're not going to judge ourselves, okay? But one thing we do know, people with PTSD and trauma, we've got problems with this, okay? There, there's problems with this. Um, so, so basically, uh, uh, you have to realize, not judge yourself, but realize that uh, when you start to feel yourself emotionally slip or mentally, slip, maybe your concentration's not, you know, maybe you're a student and then you're just not studying, uh, you, you have to realize that, that for whatever reason there is stress there that is fatiguing the frontal lobe that is causing sort of this malfunction, okay? So, you know, it, it, you know it's so easy uh, to condemn oneself uh, for one's failings, but um, these are normal responses to abnormal demands from the environment, okay? So, and then, and then, okay, and I can't remember, I, I can't remember if we actually talked about this. So, ultimately, ultimately, how do we overcome the horrific effects of trauma? How, how, do, how do we overcome this? Well, um, number one, okay, there's a couple things. Number one, you've got, okay, you have to understand that stress is additive. Stress is additive, okay? So the more, it, this is cool. So we're taking stress out of the realm of woo-woo, or, or I should say not even woo-woo, but like science that might be dated. You know, the, the stress that people understand now is actually the brilliance of 20 years ago. And there's been a lot of stuff 
I mean, it's been a parabolic uh, increase in understanding and the mechanisms of stress in 20 years. I mean, seriously, since I first started studying to now, it is mind blowing. Okay. So basically we understand that stress is additive. Okay. And what you're going to need to do, I mean, this is real basic, just like you would uh, if you were on a diet and you had a food diary or you have, you know, trying to control your spending and so you have a, a money spending diary, you have to have some sort of inventory or diary of uh, the stresses, especially the stressors um, that you are exposed to on a continual basis that just kind of eat at you little by little. Remember, stress is additive. And the more we pile up, okay, the more our, the odds are our systems become overwhelmed and we suffer from stress-related problems and disease and early death, okay? Okay, so you need to, to inventory your stressors. You can take, you can take my uh, my free um, stress assessment. Um, this is 20 years in the making, and it's totally free. There's no obligation, but you can see where your problem areas are, and depending on your score, I can determine for you've got low, medium, or high stress. Now, if you're a person of trauma, chances are um, you're going to have probably pretty high stress. Okay, um, because it's not just maybe the stressors of extreme traumas, but traumatic people, okay, tend to have just more trauma unrelated because when you're overwhelmed, okay, normal problems of life can overwhelm you and thus causing even more trauma because your brain's just overwhelmed. You, you don't have more resources to solve problems and think for the future, okay? I mean, you're just... You're just dealing with today, okay? So, um, go through, go ahead, go ahead, take my test. It's, it's totally free, totally free. Um, and find out where your problem areas are, okay? And then just start eliminating them. I mean, seriously, it's like, like you're keeping a food diary. Oh, well, you know, I'm eating way too much sugar in the morning. I need to cut that out. Okay, it's the same type of thing. And sometimes, you know, you know, as you take a, you know, a, the stress evaluation test I have on my website, um, you will realize uh, that um, it's not just psychological stressors. We got chemical and physical stressors as well. So, um, I mean, it might be small things like uh, reducing pollution in the home. I mean, you know, if you've got like a lot of cleaning chemicals, a lot of pollution in your home. If you're a person under trauma, I know it might seem unrelated, but since stress is additive, it might be good, you know, to clean up your house, for instance, okay? It might be good to be very careful at the um, the different substances you're putting in your body, whether it's um, different types of pharmaceuticals, various habits, or really crappy, terrible processed food. Again, these are all very severe chemical stressors. Um, you know, another uh, stress. You know, go over in other videos. But um, another type of stressor that's very common is uh, our disrupted uh, biome or the uh, the friendly uh, bacteria that hang out, not just in our gut, but like on our skin and all of our orifices. Okay, so. Um, um, you know, these population of critters uh, help us adapt, help uh, help us synthesize um, vitamins, various growth factors, regulators for the immune systems, wound healing. Um, it's not just critters living in your gut, taking what scraps you're not eating. They are physiological extensions in our modernized um, society. Uh, we have disrupted these. So Again, um, you know, and gut health is, um, you know, kind of deranged um, gut microbe populations um, is, has been, this is one of the really crazy cool things that have come recently in the last 20 years, I very much uh, uh, participate in the development of many types of illness, including schizophrenia, all types of uh, autoimmunity. So, I mean, again, uh, you know, we're not always talking about the bad boss, although, believe me, that's, you know, or bad relationships. Um, we're talking real small things, 
um, that we can do because, again, since stress is additive, the more that you keep on your plate, the less your carrying capacity, especially for your frontal lobe, is going to be. So when you're trying to recover lost concentration, lost uh, emotional regulation, it is really important to actionably literally reduce the number of stressors in your life. Okay, that's number one. Okay, I mean, really, seriously. Number two is because, remember, we talked about um, we had, when we're under trauma, um, our memory, certain memory centers, and again, part of those are in the frontal lobe, part of those are in our emotional, other older emotional systems, we call it limbic system, um, become uh, overwhelmed and become da become damaged. And the good news is some of this is irreversible. Okay, we can grow in in uh, this part of the brain. It's called the hippocampus. We do have the ability for some regeneration. So it's not all lost. Okay, so it's not all lost. It's amazing the type of recoveries people can make. Okay, um, so when we have trauma, um, the emotional reactions that we felt, like of terror or whatever, um, become fragmented. Okay, so so this is how, okay, you know, see, this is another thing uh, that you will learn, another cool psychobiology lesson. So a fully developed human thought, okay, has two components. You've got your your nonverbal uh, perceptual component with your emotions and the feeling. And, and, and then you've got the verbal, okay? And all the verbal does is put labels, okay? So you see that table over there, that's your perception. The word table is just a label, okay? So don't put too much stock in the language. Our language is important, but don't, it's so they're just labels. The real reality is going to be um, in the perception, and that, that's usually your right brain. And um, so you have the perception, and then you have the label, okay? Well, somehow during the stress response, this activity gets disrupted. And so you might have these fragments of memories, like these flashes of memories that might invoke, like, say, a response of terror, okay? But you can't really get your words around it. You know, it's kind of like, <gasps> you know, again, that freeze response, right? See, this is all fitting together. I'm trying to make this easy. Um, because most people are actually very intelligent, and they can, if, if uh, we're not... Um, talking, you know, in the lingo that goes over people's heads that takes a million years to learn. People understand processes. So um, that, that, you know, um, effect, okay, is kind of just, it, it, so it, you have these invasive thoughts and they don't have really a narrative, okay. So, okay. Um, a big key is, this is not original, big key is, is to form a narrative, okay, which means you have to visit um, the, uh, the stressor, you know, the traumatic stressor, and um, be able to put full words and narrate it properly. Not narrate it like a robot, like, yes, um, you know, there are some people that, like, for instance, uh, you know, maybe you were in uh, the Iraq War, and they'll, or maybe you're a victim of rape or, you know, extreme uh, sexual, uh, child sexual molestation. A lot of times people will talk about it in nonchalant, like, yeah, I, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was in the, the war and, uh, you know, I saw five of my buddies killed and, you know, okay. That there, that's not a real narrative. The, the narrative is combining the verbal with the full emotional spectrum of this. And you've got, and the thing is, okay, remember, 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 um, you have to feel safe doing this. See, that's the key. That's the key. You have to feel safe while forming this narrative. This is why a lot of people with trauma, this is real practical, this is people, this is, uh, if you like Pete Walker and he is a hero and he came up with the fawn response, which is a part of a freeze, type of a freeze, it's kind of like a surrender response. 
Um, a lot of codependent people have that. Uh, Pete Walker's absolutely brilliant. Um, way underrated for the brainiac he is. Um, so, so basically, uh, you have to form a narrative with that full spectrum of terror or whatever that you felt. And then that is when the load comes off your shoulders. Because you have to understand your poor frontal lobe is overtaxed dealing with all this non, this continual um, uh, fragmented, you know, invasion of memories. It's very stressful on your system. There, you know, it's in a way um, the horrific uh, flashback phenomenon. There has been um, theories thrown out that it's almost like it's a, an induced type of seizure, emotional uh, type of seizure. Um, I, you know, again, I don't... Because it, it almost seems the way it abruptly comes through sim, uh, seemingly innocuous triggers does suggest some sort of a... Sort, we call it a leptiform. But again, you know, this assumes, this is in, you know, implies that... There's pathology. No, this is a normal response to really extreme conditions. Okay, so the point is, is to, if you're wanting to get over, you have absolutely, at whatever cost, okay, need to find yourself in a safe spot, okay? And you might have to break off some relationships um, that are really, that are causing you more trauma, or, or uh, situations. I, I know for me, um, you know, my experience living in the United States, living, um, at least, I know with the, well, this is common with a lot of cultures in the U.S., a declining culture um, where, you know, um, a lot of us are dying a lot younger than our great-grandparents or grandparents, you know, the folks born in, the 20s and 30s that grew up during the Depression. Um, well, the boomers, um, a lot of them, I'm, again, <laughs> just look at the news. Look at the celebrities. You know, look at the celebrities that have died. Fairly young. I mean, you know, in their 50s, 60s, um, not even 70, okay? And you know that, you know, if, if you're, you know, in this day and age, with, in theory, all the access to advanced, you know, technology and all that, um, you know, we should be living to be a hundred, but um, uh, just, just just look at your own family. Is it shrinking? You know, I mean, if not, that's great, but if, um, you know, you just, just look around, look around your neighbors, your friends, and um, look at their state of health, especially when you start getting your 30s and 40s. Look, just look around, look around, you know, and you realize that um, our um, society does have a problem. So I know with me, um, with you know, I found life in the U.S. was for me too stressful. Now, other people may live in different uh, situations, different geographical areas, whatever you know, maybe. But I found uh, life to be very brutal uh, for my very very sensitive constitution, and I personally had to get out. But you don't necessarily have to get out. You don't necessarily have to leave. I mean, that might be a situation. But, but um, the key is you have to feel safe, okay? You, whatever it takes. Because, okay, th this, is, this is more biology. This is more. See, you're going to be learning a whole lot. You, I, it took us scientists, really, if you want to look at it, a thousand years, more than a thousand years. But if you really want to look at it on a micro scale, at least 150 years, to be able to fully um, under understand this, okay. So, um, let's see what else, okay. So, the biology of safety, okay. So ultimately, I want you to remember this. In order to feel safe, you have to have higher oxytocin levels. And how do you have higher oxytocin levels, okay? You do that with some sort of bonding, okay? Usually it's with other people, but it can be with animals. It can be, now, here in Ecuador, 
Uh, this is uh, this is reality. I mean, I know this for a fact. Um, the indigenous um, they depend very much on nature, so that's bonding with nature. Um, and if you look at parts of the Amazon that have been destroyed, the indigenous aren't doing too well. They're they're stressed people, so it can be bonding. Uh, I know I bond with nature. Um, you know, I know that that uh, helps me with my oxytocin. And uh, you bond with people around you. If you can't find a safe person, find an animal to bond with. Really try to find people that aren't just going to be sticking in your craw, okay? That, you know, you're going to be able to disclose how you feel and not feel like you're having to edit yourself. So, and that could be a therapist. That could be a, a, a group that could be your best friend, I mean, it could be me, you know, um, it can be, you know, there's many, many modalities to do this. But you've got to feel safe. You have to feel safe, okay? That is the key. That is the magic ingredient. Once you feel safe and you can narrate your experience and you can itemize your stressors and make a um, plan, you know, just Start eliminating the low-hanging fruit, you know, the easy. Don't, don't start with the hard stuff. Start with super easy. Because remember, your frontal lobe may be already stressed. And putting more self-control and, you know, kicking yourself in the butt type of self-discipline, you don't want to overload that. You want to just do the easy stuff first. So do that. And, uh, okay, gosh, okay, then I have one final final soapbox. Gosh, we're already at 31 minutes. Okay, we have one final soapbox left. It's extremely important, okay? Now, this is for all the would-be parents and parents out there, okay? Are you listening? It is... I would like for you to Google the Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire. It's 10 questions. And I've talked about it before. You got questions like, were your parents divorced? Was there mental illness? Was there addiction? Were you neglected? Were you, um, you know, sexually abused? There's 10 questions. Very, very simple. And these are basically culturally universal. Um, that They've administered this very simple questionnaire to many tens of thousands and looking at people over a long span. So this has been going on for decades, this study. Um, I believe it's uh, in, in um, through Kaiser Permanente. It's uh, Alan uh, Fertitti, I think. Alan Fr uh, Fertitti, brilliant man. I, I mean, out of this chart, off of the, the charts of. Br in fact, the findings of people that start answering four of these questions out of these ten questions, basic stuff. A lot of us have. You start getting some massive risk factors. And when you start getting into like five, six, and seven, just half to like six and seven of these questions being an affirmative, yeah, then you're, you're looking at a greatly reduced um, life expectancy. Statistic, I'm not saying, I'm just saying statistically. So there's gonna be winners, there's gonna be losers, but you're gonna be on the losing side, okay? And, and disease and problems socially, jobs, um, infection, like, you know, uh, I mean, everything, every s social scourge and problem, okay, is associated with childhood trauma. Now, I want all parents and would-be parents to really, really listen to me, okay? I want you to go and look up the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, okay? And if you're not a parent yet, I want you, before you become a parent, do what you can to not accidentally expose your child to as many of these stressors on the adverse childhood experience um, survey as possible. Okay, and if you're already a parent, really go through these and see if your child is is exp how many, I mean, really be honest about it. This is not insulting. This is just things when we're stressed people. Um, this is how this becomes generational. This is how these type of uh, problems that we have with dissociation are passed from one generation to the other. 
okay? Because since your child's frontal lobe is totally immature until about 25, I mean, at least an adult, I mean, but like when you're talking five, six years old, they're not a little adult. They don't have, remember, the frontal lobe is, as humans, our primary stress response organ. And so you're talking in children a stress response organ that is not fully developed to deal with stress. And then when they deal with the severe family stress, okay, this has an effect that, this has an effect that will follow your children for the rest of their lives. And, you know, no parent ever wants to purposely hurt their children or cause them maybe to die early, you know, because of the stress um, that, you know, happened in the house when they were children, okay? But I, if you're not yet a parent, but you want to be, look at these. I mean, you want to have the most healthy, uh, adaptive children possible, right? You don't want, because I mean, this is going to affect you. I mean, children that can't self-actualize and fully grow to full human being, it's just, it's going to do nothing but come back and bite you. I mean, they're not going to be fully independent children. You might have to be taking care of grandchildren. See, this is the type of stuff that happens that gets repeated. So download that and do a real close look at that and you know, try to see how many of those stressors you can eliminate from your child's life because seriously, we're looking at a real cultural decline here. And you, this is never talked about. But again, this is on uh, uh, Wikipedia. You can, you know, <laughs> if it's on Wikipedia, it's got to be true. But, but I mean, this is sort of like, um, you know, in our face. And it's so extreme. I mean, when you're looking at, when, like, say, with interviews with Vessel Band Cook or uh, Alan uh, Fittetti, or um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's not Frattini. Frattini? Fr Frattetti. Anyway, uh, you can look them up. Um, many others. Stephen Levine. They're like, oh my God. I mean, I mean, it's so massive that you're talking child abuse, childhood stress. It so causes such a massive... And we're, and we're talking also trauma for adults as well is such a huge problem that that these guys they were like oh my god i mean i mean this is like you know when you st stick your head in the tr bucket of truth and you're just kind of like oh you know well these problems are so expensive and so massive that they threaten I i'm not kidding here to bankrupt our societies bankrupt and destabilize and and um, look look at the population deceleration okay um, we're not having enough kids to even sustain the population we have too many people as it is right but um, you look at like for instance um, the indigenous down here in Ecuador seem to be doing just fine. They're, they're probably some of the most, uh, you know, uh, adaptative people, the success, evolutionarily successful people, seriously. Um, they just don't suffer like we do um, in the modernized culture world. But, but, let me tell you, um, if you look at the indigenous and the birth rates and the death rates in the U.S., they're going to be extinct probably in 50 years. I, this is a mega. Don't, don't kill the messenger here. But the indigenous, for instance, in the U.S., are under extreme stress. And they have been for many generations now. And they've got the absolutely lowest birth rate. And 
one of the highest mortality rates, I mean, you know, as far as early mortality in the modernized world. Okay, so are they even going to exist in 50 years? You can look at a lot of stressed societies. Um, we look at the, the um, ex-Soviet Union and the, the, you know, the various, uh, um, the Russian bloc, the R Russia and the Eastern bloc countries, uh, um, you, know, uh, you know, various, um, you know, the, the, the basically that whole region. Um, well, pretty much, even though, like for Russia, Vladimir Putin um, has really done what he can to save the falling population. It's the same thing with the indigenous. Very, very low birth rate. I mean, and he's, he's notched up. You need 2.1 per woman, and I think they're up to 1.6 or 1.7, I mean, which is still free fall. And then you've got the uh, uh, early mortality, especially with men. I mean, a lot of men dying in their 50s. It's the same thing with the indigenous. So, um, well, the Russians exist in 50, 75 years. Look at the Japanese. Oh, my gosh. Well, they already had, um, again, this is a culture under stress. They already had a falling birth rate. Okay, they already had, it was already, you know, it's already stressful to be a mom. You know what I mean? It's not, again, you know, a young woman needs to, needs to feel safe to have kids, okay, for the most part. I mean, there are accidents, there are exceptions. But for the most part, if you want a full functioning family, women need to feel like they're not going to be starving or living on the streets or, you know, lack of support. You know, or when you have that, it doesn't matter if you have birth control or not. It'll look at the depression, and we didn't have hardly any birth control depression, and birth rates fell big time, big time. So don't think for one minute a stressed out society does not affect fertility rates. It is like one of the first things to go. Your, <laughs> your ability to pop out them babies uh, from a man or a woman's perspective, the quality of your repro is directly related to stress. Well, they've got that stupid Fukushima thing where everybody on that island um, was basically uh, uh, poisoned with radiation, I mean, including Tokyo. And um, so they already had it, and then they have radiation. What is all ra the stress, the radiation? Your reproductive system. Remember, any type of stress, it can be emotional, or it can be the stress of chemical radiation. It's all the same. There goes your birth rate. Okay, so will the Japanese exist 50, 75 years? So, so again, we're looking at highly uh, destabilizing. We're, we're, you know, we don't necessarily need more people, but um, what seems to be happening, and this is happening all over the world, many parts of Europe, um, uh, China, oh boy, China, um, is you're having way negative birth rates. And this explains a lot of the reason um, that um, our governments are permissive with uh, a lot of immigration because they see that we're not having kids and they see a demographic catastrophe. And, oh, we need to get young, fresh workers and you know, people to pay taxes and support the old. Well, that's why we're harvesting them from uh, various developing nations. Okay, so... See, stress isn't all just biology. You're getting into hardcore anthropology, sociology, political science, economics with this as well. But I want you to remember, if you want to be the best parent, go look at the Adverse Childhood Experiences survey and do whatever you can to not expose your child to that. Okay, because, I mean, this is the future. I mean, um, you know, you never... I don't, like I said, I don't think there's really any parent who consciously thinks, man, you know, I want to destroy my child so bad that um, they're not able to hold relationships together or maintain health and they end up dying in their mid-50s or late 40s. I mean, I mean, no parent. But when we're dissociating and the stress of parenthood gets to us, we tend to do things that we don't realize. Okay. So, um, for the love of God, um, do what you can to minimize the stressors on um, your children, extreme stressors on your children. Um, you talk about a gift for the future humanity. 
that's what it's all about. So um, we're going on 45 minutes. I think this is the final video uh, on trauma. I guess we've got um, about an hour and a half total on this or more. So um, if you have any questions, give me a call. Um, go ahead, go to my website, um, take uh, the free stress evaluation. And, and let me know what you find out if you uh, find out anything new about yourself. And of course, uh, if you need help, um, I do have limited slots, but uh, go ahead and contact me if you'd like for me to uh, help you manage your stress the high, hardcore scientific way. Have a great day. I guess I'm going to have to wrap up now. Bye-bye.